<laughs> I love it, baby. It's great. And don't go away because our new cartoon is on soon. Visionaries. <laughs> magic. It's all magic. What are you laughing at? Nothing wrong with that. And also, Fuzzbox music there. There's also music from Prefab Sprouts. We have a pilot film. Would you like to be a pilot? Do you fancy that? Yep. Stay tuned. Don't go away. And our guest on the press conference is Dr. Alan Marion Davis. All the votes are coming in now for, for Andy. Oh, Ed and Reveridge is in here or something. No, 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 they're daffodils. Of course, it's a very spring-like feel to going live today. It's not actually the first day of spring, but we decided that winter had gone on long enough. It's time for spring, but it's also time for some letters. Well, look at these. I did manage to find, I lost the other uh, red nose letter earlier on. I've found it now. This is my dog, Ben, with his contribution to comic relief. And that's come from Louise Ellis and Ben. And she lives in Market Waiton. Have a look at this. Look, look at little Ben there with his red nose on. <laughs> and we've got some more photos here. This is a good one. Dear Philip and Gordon, I live in West Bromwich, West Midlands, and there are two streets. One is called Schofield Avenue, and the other is Gordon Avenue. And they say, yeah, named after you. Did you go up and open it? Is it the question has been asked. It's come from Lindsay Hall, who's age 13. Yeah. Hang on a minute. There's the first one. There is Gordon Avenue, with Gordon standing by the side of the, uh, the street there. And here, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see this because these are really tiny, but take my word for it. It does say Schofield Avenue just up there. You can hardly see that, can you? Can't we get any closer? Here we go. Here we go. It's all right. I'll move. I'll move. I'll move. I'll move. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. There. There. Now you can see it. Schofield Avenue. I don't quite know why my picture's on the road, but there we go. Best place for it, actually. I just say, I heard yesterday that there were some schools who didn't take part in comic relief. Boo hiss. Now, you've got a whole year now to get yourselves together. My old school, I heard, Newquay Trotheris School in Newquay, the headmaster said, no, the red nose interferes with school uniform. Pa, ba, humbug. Next year, come on, get your acts together. I know that some schools actually had sponsored red nose day, and you could wear your red nose if you paid 10p. So let's hope that all the schools who were a little on the stuffy side, it has to be said, this year, take part next year. This one here has got nothing to do with red noses at all, but it's a magnificent impression. Have a look at this. <laughs> look at this. Here you go. I wondered if you might be interested in this photo of our newborn baby, Ellie, who seems to bear a remarkable resemblance to David Jason from Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> what do you reckon? <laughs> True. So keep them coming in. Keep those letters coming in. <laughs> They're great fun to get. I mean, it's a silly photo. I mean, look at this one here. This is a young chap. Um, it actually was addressed to Trevor and Simon, but I nicked it because they weren't going to have time to do it. It says here, this is little John and nephew Matthew swinging their pants over Christmas. Look at him down there. That's Matthew swinging his pants. So send your letters in. Loads and loads of people did get involved in comic relief. Uh, we, of course, have our own, our own people here on Going Live who like to get involved and, and do various things. So the singing corner here is their involvement for comic relief. Hello. Hello and welcome to a very special outdoor edition of the, the Singing, singing corner. corner. Join in, everybody, and swing your pants. Oh, there doesn't seem to be anybody here to swing our pants with. Oh, oh look! Oh, 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 look! Look! Oh, a piece of litter. No, it's a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Singing Corner, please come to Dentwater School and swing your pants for Comet Relief. Oh, well, we've got to go there, I suppose. I wish I hadn't written that letter. I hope Sting Corner don't come in. Yeah, they're so stupid. Hello. Hello! Are you Stephen Lynn? No, no. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Did you write a letter? Yeah. Ha! Oh, oh here I did. Oh, Ooh. look! Red balls. Red balls? Are we going to play snooker? Play snooker at home? <laughs> they're very nosy. Oh. They're supposed to wear them. 
Oh, Ooh. all right then. But as long as they don't make us look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, join in then. And swing your pants. Swing your buckets. Too funny. One, two, oh, one, two, three, four. Cross Cross that Derwent Water School, who were with Singing Corner, had the pleasure of Singing Corner's company a little while ago. They raised £60 in their cake sale for Comet Relief, so well done. And apparently, uh, Singing Corner, they managed to uh, lend their own special brand of comedy to Comet Relief as well. And uh, they are adding to that total of £60, kids. So well done with that. But now, of course, it's time for Live Line. And we hope that it'll be uh, another performing live line if you see what I mean. We've managed to have a few sing songs over the last couple of weeks, a bit of uh, hip hopping, beatboxing and all that kind of thing. Well, we're hoping we may have something along those lines with this live line. Now the phone is ringing. I'll just switch that so you can hear it. Hello? <coughs> right. It's ringing Hi. away. Oh, uh, good morning. Hello. Hello, is that Tom? Yes. Tom Roberts? Yeah. Oh, hello. It's Sarah Green here on Going Live. Hi. Hi. You're, you're talking live on the television at the moment. <laughs> How are you feeling this morning? Fine. Are you feeling in a musical mood? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Um, is there any way in which you can get your phone near a set of drums? Yes, yeah, sure. You can do that, can you? While you do that, I'm just going to read a letter out to everybody else, OK? OK. So you go and get yourself sorted out by the drum kit. Now, right. here's a letter that we've had from a chap called Alistair C. Mm -hmm. I'm writing to you to ask a big favour. Please could you ring up my friend on Liveline? His name is Tom Roberts, and he is the most brilliant drummer in the world. He can play anything you request. I think he deserves this call as he works hard and helps others to play the drums who are not so gifted. He's a gifted chap. Please phone Tom Roberts, yours, Alistair Fee. Alistair, it's done. We phoned Tom Roberts. Hopefully now he is sitting by his drum kit. Are you there, Tom? Hello? Hello? Tom, please, please don't leave us now. Are you there? Come back. Thomas? Thomas the drummer? Speak to me. Speak to me. I tell you what, Tom, if, if somebody in your family at home is watching the telly, I'm going to switch off now and I'm going to redial you, OK? So you put the phone down because I think we've got a bit of a cross line. I'll try again. <laughs> this is what I love about live life. Now, chaps, chaps, can I have a line on this phone, please? Yeah, OK. Can I have a line on the phone? Thank you very much indeed. Let's try again. I've got the number here. There we are. By the way, this just gives me a little opportunity to say thank you to everybody who rang into my phone that I sat, I sat answering the phone for Comic Relief a couple of hours last night in the heart of London. And, um, and it was terrific. The phones never stopped ringing and took lots of pledges and lots of people said could you please say hello to me tomorrow morning on going live so i say hello to all those people i think there's one chap called kieran now are we going to get a ring now anything happening it's actually dead as a door now and that's a bit of a shame because i think tom was ready to play his drums there we were certainly ready for him can i just give it one more go i'm going to give it one more go and i'm going to there we are. Just dial on the numbers. There we are. Right, now let's see how that goes. Let's see how that goes. There we are. Now, are we going to get a ring through? Oop. There's a bit of noise there. Poor Tom. Can you imagine how Tom feels? He's sitting... Ah! 
He's sitting... Ready? Hello, Tom. Yeah? <laughs> You're there by your drums. Yeah, I'm ready to play, OK? Uh... <laughs> Tom, well done. Thanks. Thank... I don't know what happened there. I think we got across the line while you were moving from, from the, the phone to the drums, as it were. Now, we've got a bit of a test for you. We've got a famous piece of music coming up. We will stop the music when there is a rather famous drum solo bit. You'll recognise it straight away. And if you're watching, did you watch Comic Relief last night? Yes, I did. Did you see Filk? Did you see Phil Collins? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, well, I think that this will actually help you. Now, you we'll go into the yeah. music. OK, if you can recognise the title, say it when you hear it, and then we'll stop the music. Recognise it? Yeah. Can we try it? Yeah, when it comes up, you'll hear the big, famous drum bit. You always play that, yeah? Yeah, you play that. Now? Yeah, you play that. Can we have the music up, please? OK, Tom, is that you now? Tom. Sorry, I can't see the television. So. <laughs> did you hear? I... Did you play that? Yes. It sounded brilliant. Thank you. Well done, well done. And you've got Alice to feed to thank for this. <laughs> now, for that, we're going to send you this certificate. Tom Roberts broadcast live to the nation on the occasion of being the most brilliant drummer in the world and for teaching others to play on its way to you now. Thank you. Tom, do you like prefab trout? Yes. Do you like them? Yes. Well, they're on in a minute. You can hear them doing Golden Calf, their new single in just a minute. Perhaps you could play along to that. But here's a little bit about them first. The profile. I started to play the guitar, um, I suppose because I saw my younger brother uh, had it. And also school friends had guitars. Up until then, I didn't know anyone who, who played anything, really. Until I drown, until I drown, when love breaks down. Paddy and I are brothers. We were brought up in a little village in County Durham on Newcastle United football team. Uh, we'd often go and see them play. Uh, then, 1969, we got a guitar. My mother bought a guitar. And we, we started to play guitar together and have done ever since. I met up with the others mentally when I was lying in the bath listening to a radio show a few years ago. And I heard Paddy being interviewed uh, about some of his earlier records, which were released on Just a Kitchen Where Label. And uh, at the time, I'd just been doing freelance session work, which got very boring, and I was looking for a good band with a good singer. Let's drive through a dust bowl. What to do, do, do a young soul. I used to go and sit with Paddy and Mart, who used to run their father's garage in Durham. And I used to go and sit with them in the garage, and one day I told Paddy that I could sing, and of course I was lying. <laughs> But um, Paddy asked, asked me to be in the group after he'd heard my wonderful guitar play. Well, the Golden Calf is one of my well, one of my oldest songs. But I wrote it when I was um, I was a teenager, so that's should I be discreet here? That was about ten years ago, <laughs> and um, it's an out and out rocker. Prefab Sprout don't often sound like this now but this is what we used to sound like a long time ago, and we can still sound like it if we want to.
Have a pew. Let me just shift these phones. There you go. Plonk yourself down there. Hello. Indeed. Would you like to have a pew on the stairs? Mind that squirming cable. Hello. Hi. There you go. Do you, have you have a, have a, have a, on the back. Have a few here. here. Have a few here. Have a few down here. Mm -hmm. There we go. So we can get everyone in. We can we can see you all. Uh, um, that song. You just sat there. But how long did you say before you decided to do it? Since 1978. Oh, that's an incredible amount of time to, it to wait. Why did you wait so long? Well, because we sort of grew out of um, that particular style, which is a very live band sound, mm. and um, we did it as a B side originally and yeah. then the way it, it turned out we thought it was so exciting that we had to put it out as a single because it's actually got quite a live feel which is yes. a bit unusual for prefab right. and you don't you don't also do very much live work do you don't go no, we don't we are uh, we are the the howard hughes group <laughs> of the pop world <laughs> why is that why did you did you decide not to well to, to write more songs when you when you when you tour Although it's great fun to play in front of people, the actual travelling doesn't allow you to do anything else, which is a shame. You know, you can't really write songs while you travel. Yeah, a lot of bands get pushed into the position where they go on tour and they come back and suddenly they have to come up with a new album, just like that. Right. It can be a problem. So, so do, you, do you all quite like breaking that format, you know, the way it's expected to be? When do you? The way it's expected to be done and... Uh... Yeah, I don't think you need to do anything in any way that's expected of you. Yeah. It's just important for Paddy to be able to write the best songs, not to have to. There was I heard um, and, and quite an interesting thing about, about the songs and about what you wanted out of the songs um, mm. was that it should allow a teenager's imagination to run riot, which is really a, quite an interesting way to look at it, really. Well, yeah, I think that um, no matter what kind of music you like, whether you, you know, you like out and out pop things, or um, I suppose in some in some places we'd be thought of as an older sort of music, you know, older people would like it. Um, it's important that when you listen to a record that you can imagine things as you listen to it. That's how I think we started. Yeah. Being fans of other people's records it would make your imagination spin. And the noise is off today and making my imagination spin. <laughs> I'm thinking, what could that be? Did somebody fall out of the roof, I was thinking. <laughs> Let's take some phone calls. <laughs> right, there we go. One for you. What have you done to your thumb? Well, you're not going to believe this. I cut myself shaving. You cut Yay. your thumb shaving. <laughs> <laughs> I was stood there like this. Hang on. <laughs> I'm a werewolf, you see. Uh, is that what it is? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> line one, first of all. Who's on line one? Believe me, it's easier that way. Is it? <laughs> I've got a phone I can have here. Line one, and it says they're written down here. Michelle Harrison. Hello, Michelle. Hello. <laughs> What's your question? What's it like working with your brother? Ah, brother Which thing. brother are you asking? Well, you let's ask, ask both of you, really. Let's let's start start with you. What, what's it like working with your brother in the band? Um, it's easy. Is it? It's yeah. wonderful. It's, it's wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> it's great. Because there was the, the if you look at uh, a Hugh a Cry, you know the the Kane brothers. There was that sort of feuding thing apparently between the brothers. I mean, do you ever have any trouble between a pair of you? We are very similar mm. in in terms of the things that we like. So if we work together and we're sat in the studio, and there's a mm. sound we either mm. like or dislike. We, we know don't... what each other th are thinking yeah. about. We just, we in, um, instinctively turn around and go, uh, or we go, <laughs> oh, yeah, at the same time. And uh, that's probably because we're brothers. You, you, it's, we're very close in the, the taste that we have. We know, yeah. Mm. Maybe you're not the right people to ask. So Wendy, what is yeah. it like yeah. having two brothers in the, uh, in the oh, It's band? really dreadful. They fight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Me do and you I often have to come between them. Do you two find yourself sort of outvoted that they get, you know, sort of their, their when it comes to having something, mm. deciding on something, that, uh, that they get their way? <laughs> no. Not really, no. No? Not I, I, I always get my way. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot, actually. I completely forgot they were brothers. You just reminded me. Oh, really? Well, that's, that's quite a good way to do it, then, in case if you forget. Next call, and it's line two and Amanda. Morning, Amanda. Hello. Hi, Morning. off you go. Hello. What did you enjoy most about making your last album? Sorry, I missed that. What did you enjoy Enjoying. most about making your last album? Finishing it. New album. <laughs> Finishing. Avocados. <laughs> he likes avocados. And yeah. we, should I talk into this? Is it better? Can well, she won't be able to hear you phone? otherwise if she's not <laughs> sitting by a tele television. Um, That's a good point. Well, did you? Was it a long time in the making? Did you? It was a long time in the making because we did it with several different producers.
but one of the best bits that we really enjoyed was when we went to stay in Los Angeles with Thomas Dalby to record four tracks. We really enjoyed that, didn't we? Yeah, because he lives, he lives out there permanently, really. He lives out in the hills. And it was a very, <laughs> yes. Very, nice. very unusual for us to come in from Newcastle to mm -hmm. see all those yeah. things you'd seen in the films. Were you Star impressed Tom. by it all? Were you impressed by it? Yes, I was impressed because um, no, no matter how many times you've seen it on the television or in films, to actually walk through it, you want to snigger all the time because you see landmarks like the sign with the letter falling off and all that. Right. And you, it's, it's like being in a cartoon. Good one. All right. So, and uh, you, you're pleased with the, with the finished? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Happy, happy that it's over, but pleased with the finishes. Well. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. Thank you for your call, Amanda. And the, the prize. You have a great prize, which. Uh, you do. Be. Let's have a look at this. Now, tell me, who's going to tell me about this then? Because there is a, an interesting story behind this. Wendy. I'll tell you about it. All right. It's an original cartoon drawn by the team from Viz Comics, who are also from Newcastle, like we are. And we gave a donation to Comic Relief, and they're did an original prefab sprout cartoon for us. Right. And if anybody wants to make a donation to Comic Relief, they'll be in Time Slip Comic Shop today, this afternoon in Newcastle upon Time. Time. Right. And they'll do you an Terrific. original sketch. And this this is an absolute original? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What a prize. All right, what's the question? Well, this will really have you straining at <laughs> home. <laughs> Could you finish the sentence? Hot dog, jumping frog. <laughs> you have to spell it right. Yes. Hot yeah. dog, jumping frog, and you've got to spell it right too. You must get the spelling right. All right. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. A great. Okay. This is a fabulous prize, mm -hmm. and I know you've also got some uh, some it's bits and bobs it's down the you know the, the singles and the what's this a jigsaw? This is the a, a, oh. this is the prefab Again. sprout. Um, Rock and roll trivia quiz. Oh, good. <laughs> and all the questions are about prefab some, sprouts? Yes. And some t-shirts. Good idea. Well. T-shirts, yeah. records. Videos. All the biz. Thank you. The lot. Oh, look at this. Thing. It's like the whole CD. lot. So if you haven't got a CD player, then you've got the cassette as well. So thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Thank Great you. pleasure. The best of luck with the single and the album. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, the address to write to, as always, of course, entries on a postcard to Going Live, BBC TV, London W12, HQT Going Live, BBC TV, London W12, 8QT. And now, we're back to those cheeky teenagers. Last week, Dick and Johnny found out that being a teenager was just great. Let's see what those two cheeky teenagers are up to this week in episode two of Dick and Johnny. Hi, Dick. Hi, Johnny. I didn't expect to find you here. I thought you were being a big old stuffy goody do good and staying in because your mummy said so. Not me. I gave my folks a good ticking off for treating me like a little boy. Cooey! Really? What did you say? I said, look here, mother and father, why can't you let me be like the other teenagers? Gosh, Dick, and what did they say? They said, because you're an empty headed, jumped up little upstart of an idiot. That's why. That's funny. My parents said exactly the same to me. Me. Huh, grown-ups, hey, they always manage to find out the truth, don't they? That's right, Dick, they do. Hey, look, Johnny, a jukebox. Wow, it's great! <laughs> no, Johnny, this is the jukebox. Look, it's the latest thing. You lean on it like this and then shake your head from side to side. Doesn't it play records as well? Maybe. Hey, have you got a coin? Sure, Dick. Here. Oh. Here, Dick. Thanks. See you, Johnny. Hey, Dick. What about my money? <laughs> Only joking. And you really fell for it. <laughs> I did, didn't I? You're a real prankster, you are. In fact, Dick, you're such a prankster, I'm going to call you Tricky Dicky Dick from now on. OK, and you're so stupid, I'm going to call you Stupid Dimbo Johnny, especially when all the guys are around. <laughs> Those guys, I like that. Oh, it's great fun being a teenager. <laughs> you said it. Tune in again for more Teenage Volics with Dick and Johnny. 
Dick and Johnny on that soapbox bit, doesn't he? That, and that little sting that happened there. It looked like Dick and Johnny sort of crossed between the two of them. Well, food has been very much in the news lately. Firstly, with reports about salmonella in eggs, and more recently, with warnings about soft cheeses. Well, we took our cameras out and about to find out what you think about the food we eat. I think we should be warned about the dangers of certain foods because then it would save a lot of people from getting salmonella or food poisoning and would warn people to watch their foods in the near future. But I also think it is wrong to tell the public before these things are rightly predicted because then some people turn, tend to overreact without reason. I don't think Edwina Curry was right to say that most eggs were infected because lots of farmers lost their profits, but I do think that people should have been warned. I think that Mrs Edwina Curry was right to say that most eggs had salmonella, but not all eggs. This didn't stop me from eating eggs, you just have to take the risk. Also, it's bad because the chickens are kept in tiny cages and fed other dead chickens. I think the publicity about food is a good thing, but they shouldn't make such a big issue about it. They should just tell us the food what's bad for us and let us decide if we want to eat it or not. I think all this publicity about food is a good thing because we should all know what's inside our food we eat. But then again, it may stop some worried people eating things like cheeses, some meats and eggs. I think that sometimes the publicity about food is true. But personally, I think the main news wants something new to say. All the publicity about eggs hadn't stopped me eating them because they said that if you cook your eggs properly, the bacteria would die. I still enjoy eating fried eggs. Strong and, interestingly, very differing views there. Tell us what your opinions are. You can do, do that in two ways. Firstly, you can ring Dr. Alan Marion Davis, who's our press conference guest, on 01 811 8055 or you can drop us a line to Soapbox, going live, BBC TV Centre, London, W12 8QT. That's Soapbox, going live, BBC TV Centre, London, W12 8QT. What's grey and hairy and makes animals yawn? I don't know. What's grey and hairy and makes animals yawn? A wild boar. What do you get if you cross a rabbit with a flea? I don't know. What do you get if you cross a rabbit with a flea? Bugs Bunny. What cat lives under the water? I don't know. What cat does live under the water? Octopus. <laughs> You see our new cartoon, I told you it'd be good. Adrian was really upset that he's standing outside Television Centre today. He wanted to be at home watching it, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. How did you get your black eye? I was playing rugby. Were you? <laughs> Just I noticed it then. When we set the competition for you to design a poster for the 25th anniversary of the Red Arrows, we had absolutely no idea what the response was going to be like. It is incredible. This is the tiniest fraction. Have a look at some more.
is a tiny, tiny selection of the, the entries that were sent in. And here is uh, Flight Lieutenant Guy Bancroft Wilson, the pilot of Red 4. Yes. And, uh, and most remarkable piece of flying this morning, I have to say, quite magnificent. Managed to get this over the top of the tube station, up Wood Lane, came over the top of the commissioner's hut, who unfortunately shouted, I'm sorry you can't bring that in here! But he did anyway and parked it here in the uh, in the car park of town. Was there any problems? Well, nobody said it would be easy. Yeah. They yeah. said, you know, handbrake turn around the flagpoles, but yeah. it was all right. Oh, it's a handbrake turn around the... No, no problem at all. Nah. This guy's need an agent soon. He's getting good. <laughs> Second time on telly. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. And thanks very much indeed for, for judging uh, our entries. Let's go Hello through again. them. There were four categories. There were the um, the eights and unders, the nines to elevens, and the twelve to sixteen, and of course the overall winner. So let's uh, first of all start with the the um, eights and unders, which is this one here. Yeah. Terrific. Liked it. And a good use of colour. Air traffic control. Yeah. Red five. Bit out of formation, <laughs> but not bad. Very nice. And that's... the guys liked that. All the guys actually judged this together. Mm. We had a, quite a few of the posters over and judged them ourselves and had a democratic decision. So these are the ones we like the best. Well done to Thomas Vickery, who's six years old, he's in Halifax. We'll tell Great. you about your prize in a mo, Thomas. If you hang on for a second, he'll be leaping up and down now and jumping over the back of the chair. It's me, it's me, it's me! Hold on, <laughs> hold on. The next one. Okay. This is the nines to elevens. 25 years at the top. Great. A mm -hmm. uh, bit of green smoke, yeah. That's obviously the synchro pair crossing. Mm -hmm. Very nice too. Good background, nice deep blue. Well, we like to fly nice blue sunshine, best of all. Fair that's enough. nice. Let's hope like we'll that see one. a lot of that this summer. And the winner to the 90, 90s to 11s, Robert Lewis, who is 11. Well done, Robert. Tell you about your prize in a sec. And the 12 to 16. Okay, this is terrific, this one. Showing that the Red Arrows go all over the world. A little list of our uh, venues. Mm -hmm. um, list of some of the formations and the sequences we do. Our badge. World class performers. Very nice. But uh, the perspective on it with the aeroplanes coming over the globe is terrific. Good use of colour, lots of stars. We don't actually fly at night that often, but uh, very nice. <laughs> Enjoyed that one. <laughs> All right, well done to Paul McCabe, who is in Whitby. Uh, he's 15. Congratulations to you. So those are our three runners-up. What did the runners-up get? OK, well, the runners-up get a selection of Red Arrow's uh, goodies. The youngest one here. I remember this from last time. There's a Little great flying suit. greed of the stuff. I won't go through the whole lot. <laughs> right. Very nice, just like mine. A little bit smaller. Yep. And uh, the other two winners get this flying jacket, little Red Arrows emblems on, and plus some sweatshirts, t-shirts, badges, and that sort of thing. But, but, a drum roll now. <laughs> the winner is? The winner, overall, we have here is Matthew Shaw. Terrific poster. And this poster is going to get printed up to uh, various copies on uh, big poster size paper. Mm -hmm. And we like that because it's got a great definition of speed perspective of the runway, very dynamic poster. Right, Terrific. What's, what's he won? Okay, well, he's won plus a flying suit plus all the other goodies, and it's going to get printed up, and they're all going to have a day out with us. In fact, I did say just the overall winner would have a day out, but we're so overwhelmed with the uh, standard of them, everybody here can have a day out with the Red Arrows. Oh, that's good stuff. Lovely. And you will have a brilliant time. It's a, 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 an exciting day, that's for sure. Yep. Um, but of course, I suppose we ought to really let you get this out, haven't we? So you need a bit of a run-up, don't you? I have to yeah. say, I have to say, if, we could, if I could just, you know, just for a couple of seconds, the guys phoned me up at the beginning of the last interview, mm -hmm. and they said that Guy, this is the other Red Arrow, said that Guy was in a pantomime and that he did a bit of singing. And all the way through the programme, I was thinking, I've got to get it in now, I've got to get it in now. And after the programme, apparently the rest of the Red Arrows were terribly, terribly upset that he didn't do any singing. So, <laughs> so just maybe just a little, just to please your fellow Red Arrows, who I know my they voice, wanted to come down today. My voice is just gone. a little, maybe, maybe five seconds worth. My voice is just gone. Just five seconds worth. <laughs> come on. When you're here, oh so near. That's it. <laughs> a round of applause. Come along, come along, come along. <laughs> <laughs> we I'll didn't get it. I'll kill him. <laughs> we didn't get it done last time, but this time I had to get it in this time. That's what happens if you come back twice. Guy, thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure to have you in once again, thank and you. I'm sure Enjoy our winners it. look forward to going up to Scampton. Thank you. Better stand back. Do you think about the food you eat? Are you a fussy eater, or are you always hungry and eat whatever's put in front of you? Recently, there's been a lot of concern over food scares. 
many people became aware for the first time of the possible danger of eating raw or undercooked eggs, which were infected with a bacteria called salmonella and can cause food poisoning. Eggs became bad news. The government warned the elderly, sick and pregnant women not to eat soft-boiled eggs, and an advertising campaign was launched warning people of the dangers of eating raw egg. Other food products, particularly soft cheeses, were the next to hit the headlines when there were more outbreaks of food poisoning, this time caused by an organism called Listeria. Food was in the news again. The Ministry of Agriculture has already announced its plan to ban the sale of unpasteurized milk to the public. And on the advice of government scientists, it now wants to stop its use in the production of cheese. It's thought this would further reduce the risk from Listeria. And it doesn't seem to stop there. The latest scare is from reports of a deadly disease affecting cows, which in the long term, some fear, might have an effect on us humans because we drink their milk. Last month, as a result of all these food scares, the government formed a food safety committee to protect public health. So how has your diet been affected by all these scares, if at all? And are you careful about what you eat at school as well as at home? Reports suggest not. Children are still eating far too much fat and sugar. Chips, hamburgers, crisps, chocolate and soft drinks are clogging up arteries at an early age. One disturbing finding is that many children may not have enough energy to exercise. Up to a quarter go to school with no breakfast. But eating patterns are changing in this country and more and more children are becoming vegetarian. Why? I think it's cruel, cruel to uh, young animals, like you have lamb and things like that, and I think it's cruel that they have to be killed when they're uh, young. Because it's just like us being killed when we were young and we don't experience life. Mm, well, those are just a few of the food issues that have cropped up in the news over the last few months. Well, if you're now too scared to eat an egg or you're worried about what meat's going to do to you or perhaps you're trying to find a new way of keeping fit, then you may want to talk to our press conference guest this morning. He is Dr. Alan Marion Davis. Welcome back to Going Live, Alan. Oh, great pleasure. Nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, are the letters that you receive and the phone calls that you receive from people, are they in any way reflecting the sort of concern that we were hearing about on those reports? Yes, I think so. People are really quite worried about it. There's, there's no question about it. There's the, they are scares and um, people are genuinely looking at the food they're eating and thinking, now, is this going to be safe for me? So, yes, I think people are really concerned. Do you think we're informed enough? Do I you think, think we are kept in touch with what is happening enough? I think uh, for a long time uh, we haven't been informed enough. I think it's, uh, there's been a sort of cloak of secrecy over it. Um, and I think that what's happening now is that with these scares, suddenly the, the doors are opening and we're beginning to see what's, what's been going on behind the scenes. And I think actually, although uh, uh, that perhaps you think that scares are bad for you, I think it's quite a healthy thing that we're now taking much more interest in the way our food reaches our plates and gets into our mm, mouths. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions in the press conference about the specifics of eggs and meat and cheese. But talking about being informed, there was a, a survey just come out um, about young people's knowledge about cancer. Now, I know that you had something to do with the, with the press conference surrounding that. Were you surprised by the findings that people thought that uh, cancer was catching, for example? Yes, I thought that by, these, by now, you know, a lot, of, a lot of children particularly would have seen so many programs about cancer and, and perhaps read articles about it. They would know that cancer is not catching. You know? They would know that you can't just inherit cancer from your mum and dad. Um, they would know, for instance, I mean, there were some strange things. A lot of children, some children thought, for instance, you could get cancer swimming, you know, or you could get yeah. cancer from makeup, you know, things like that. And uh, there are lots of myths that still exist about cancer. And uh, I was really quite surprised that they do still exist. Mm. What about the, moving on to, well, still health issues, ultimately, but environmental issues? A lot of pressure groups bringing up now. Do you think ultimately they work? I think they're a very good idea. I think there's no question about it that the politicians, you know, who make all the rules about society, do listen to, to pressure groups, especially if the, if the press get involved, if you can get lots of media attention. So it's well worth forming a group if you really do care yes. about something, yeah. pushing hard. Well, Alan, we've got lots more to talk about on the press conference later on this morning. Remember, ring in to Alan with any questions you like about food, health, fitness on 01811-8055. But now it's time for Heat 5 of the Young Entertainer of the Year competition. And who won Heat 4?
That's right, it's time for Heat 5 of the BBC Young Entertainer of the Year competition 1989. I'm a little concerned, Philip. I'm concerned because so far the winners of all the heats, so far, that is one to four, have all been men, blokes, chaps, boys. Oh, no girls involved. No, I know. It's I'm... worrying, isn't it? Yeah, you're going to have to wait until after we've seen our... Uh, next four contestants to find out whether the winner of Heat 4 is going to break that female duck. Mm. <laughs> quack, quack. <laughs> quack, quack. This is the fifth heat in our search for a young entertainer of the year. Well, actually, it's your search because it's because it's you who decide who is going to end up with this very special trophy on their shelf at home and who it is who's going to be joining all the other stars on Wogan because that's one of the prizes for our ultimate winner. So please get your paper and pen handy. We'll show you how to vote when you've seen today's four acts. The first uh, finalist today in Heat 5 is a young lady who's called Nikki Moran. She's from Cannock in Staffordshire. And she's going to sing Wishing You Were, Som no, Wishing you were Somehow Here Again from the Phantom of the Opera. Oh. Ah. Welcome back to Going Live. Cool, that was fab over. Did you enjoy when you came to the studio yeah. last time to actually record that? Yes, it was brilliant. The weekend was very good. Was it? Yeah. Now, when did you discover that you had such a brilliant singing voice? Well, I've always enjoyed singing. Mm -hmm. It was in the school concert at the infant school, and then they thought that I got a good voice, and one of my teachers recommended a singing teacher. And that, recently, I've just changed my teacher, but I've been having lessons for about four years now. 
Oh, so, it's certainly paid off, Nikki. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Best of luck. We enjoyed that a lot. Mm -hmm. We both know how the song goes now, don't we? At least wishing you were somehow here again. again. It's okay. Very really simple when you know how, isn't it? Our next, well done, by the way. Thank beautiful, you. beautiful. Our next finalist uh, is a young chap who's a great fan of uh, John Cleese, actually. He is called Paul Miller, and he comes from Reading. Here he is with his particular brand of comedy. <laughs> Come here, come here. I got some magic. And there's more, and there's more. What's this? A chicken's coming home from the chippy. And there's more. What's this? Double portion. Ah, oh, I see it's my buster then. Well, naughty, naughty bad. I hope you didn't put any money on those horses yesterday, Basil, because you know what I'll do if I find out that you have. What? Read it. Never go near them. Please don't let her find out. Ah, morning, Fault Hill boy. Ah, morning, Major. Can I have it? The money? The money I won on the horses. Uh, the horses? Where, old boy? No, no. I gave you the money that I won on the horses so Sybil wouldn't find out. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Don't remember that, old boy. Well, think, please, think. Ah, Mama, Mama, Mama. Now, you saw me give the money to the maid yesterday, didn't you? Hearty. Well, tell him to give it to me. I know Nazi. What? I know Nazi. No, 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 look. I forgot everything I know Nazi. No, 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 no. Tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him. Ah, I know Nazi. I from Barcelona. Right! That's right, Baldy, old boy. You did give me that money. You won it on that horse. <gasps> Not a word to Sybil. Da, mum's the word, old boy. Da, Mrs. Faulty. I found the money. The money Mr. Faulty won on the horse. I'll take that then, Basil. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm welcome to the Muppet Show. And yes, our special guest for tonight is... Yeah! The one and only... Oh, uh, oh I, I forgot. Ernie? 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 Oh, uh, uh, Gonzo? Oh, uh, has anyone seen Camilla? Uh, my favorite chicken. Oh, uh, Dunno Kermit. Oh, uh, oh, uh, busy, busy. Oh, Kermit, how could you forget the one and only? I saw Michael Jackson. private show here. This is Paul. Welcome to the program, Paul. Thanks. We'll talk about the trauma you just had in a moment. <laughs> but, um, Thunderbirds. Do the, do the Thunderbirds face pose. It's absolutely brilliant. He was doing this a second ago. I've been in fits here. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Well done. How much time do you spend um, in front of the telly studying the people that you're going to do an impression of? Well, um, and I, I watch television and I see people on there and I think they've got like a distinctive voice that you can take off. Mm. So um, I video it and I often play it back and just try and go over and over the voices and somehow it comes. Right. And this morning you had a little bit of a problem, didn't you? <laughs> I did, yeah. Would you like to tell us where you went and yes. where you nearly went? Well, um, we got to Reading and uh, they're redoing a platform at Reading so all the trains have been altered. So um, me and my friends got on at Reading and we were going to Penzance. <laughs> So you got on the train and it was going in the wrong direction? Yeah, that's it. And uh, we got off in Swindon and then we just managed to make it up here. You must have been panicking a little bit, but we're very glad that you made it. Well done and the best of luck. Thanks very much Thank indeed. You. Good luck. Thanks. Well, our third act today, Act S, is called Bond. Lawrence Bond. Do you know the trick or two?
Welcome to Going Live. Thank you. When did you start doing magic, Lawrence? Um, I started when I was about five or six. My sisters used to do a bit of magic in children's party entertaining, um, and they used to show me some magic. And so that's they actually I got taught you? Well, they just showed me my first tricks, and then from there, my parents bought me like a little magic set, and then it went on from there. And do you do lots of um, party performances now? Yes, I entertain at children's parties, and I do friendship clubs and school fakes and things and, like that. And when did you chance upon the lovely Nicole? Um, well, we went to school together when we were younger, <laughs> and we've just been friends ever since. Uh -huh. so we've kept in touch. You were persuaded to join in, join in as well. I love doing it. I didn't mind at all. Fabulous. Well, best of luck. Thank you both Thank you for coming today. Great, sir. Well done. Best of luck. Thank you. Our final act today are two young ladies who come from Essex. Um, they've actually written this song themselves. It's called Dance Class again. It's actually very funny, but I hate to think what their ballet teacher actually thinks of it. Um, they are called Double Take. Let's push in front 
so he can watch it. Am I in a right position? Do you think he'll pick us up for the audition? I think he's seen us. He looks impressed. Oh, do I do? I feel a pet. I'm sure he'll want us. In fact, I know that he'll pick us for the Black and Summer Show. Well done. Well, yeah. now, everything in that, was it all true? Yes. Yeah. So your ballet teacher's name really is Susan. Yes. Yeah. And Brian Rogers really does exist. He, yeah, he, yeah. he goes to the ballet, he does things at the ballet school. Yeah. Had they seen that? Yeah. What, did they, what was their reaction? They liked it. <laughs> that was just as well, isn't it, really? Yeah. And did you write the whole thing yourselves? Yeah, yeah. we wrote it. And um, because it was just from Camp Granada, and we was just mucking around one day, and we, we'd just come out, hello, Roxy, hello, Katie. So our mum's liked it, and we, that's where it come from, right there. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Good luck, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, luck. Good luck. In a moment, we'll tell you how to vote, and perhaps you could win a prize. But first of all, let's have a quick recap at today's four finalists. coming home from the chippy and there's more what's this double portion Well done. <laughs> now it's time for you to vote. This is what you do. You grab yourself an envelope, a card, see a postcard like that. And on here you write your, can you see that? Hello. Your name, your address and your age and the number of the act that you would like in the top corner here. Then you send it to the usual address which is going live. BBC TV, London W12 HQT. And remember that you can send your entries for the Young Entertainer of the Year competition in the same envelope, perhaps, as something else that you'd like to enter. So drop us a line and vote. Every vote cast this week will have a chance of winning this prize. There's a watch there and also, of course, the winning act as well. Now, all the votes have to be in by Thursday, so get them in quickly and get those votes down now. Is it me now? Yes, it is, isn't it? Now it's time to see who I took it so... Now it's time for us to find out who won Heat 4. <laughs> keep your money, keep your, keep your fancy clothes. Cause I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice and talented dogs on the end of my thousand feet. We'll strut down any old street. We'll do such fine combinations and figurations. Congratulations. Nikki, would you pick a, a winner out for yes. us? Someone who's going to win last week's prize. There we are. The winner is 
Della Carrot from Middle. From Belf Bedfont in Middlesex. Yes. Della Carrot, well done to you. She's nine years old. And you have won this. What was last week's prize? I can't remember what it was, actually. What, what were we giving away? There we are. There were albums. Look at all albums. those albums. Well done to you. We'll be sending those. And don't forget to get your vote in for this week's Young Entertainer. Now then, um, it's time now for the first in a brand new series of Theatre Shop. Hello there. Hello there. I'm Robin. I'm Ray. That means theatre shop. shop. Let's start off with some exercises, shall we? Shake your fingertips. Shake and, and relax. relax. Today, we're going to act out or improvise a scene between a shopkeeper and a customer. This is a shop counter, and I'm the shopkeeper. Let's see how Ray responds to my request as the customer. He is the shopkeeper. Good morning. I'd like a loaf of bread, please. I'm so sorry, sir, but we haven't any. Oh, really? Why not? This is a fish shop. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Ray. He has introduced humour into the scene. I thought I was in a bread shop, but Ray has told me I'm in a fish shop. Clever old Ray. Yes, clever old me. Let's see what happens when we swap places. Hello. Oh, what are you doing behind the counter of my fish shop? Oh dear, Ray's not concentrating, is he? Ray has forgotten that he is now the customer and we have started a new scene. Stupid old Ray. Yes, stupid old me. In theatre shop, we often get called stupid for making a simple mistake. Let's swap places and start again. Hello, I'd like some eggs, please. Are you sure, sir? Why do you ask? Are they infected with... Salmonella. <laughs> well done, Robin. He's managed to make it topical by mentioning something that's been in the news for months now. Clever old Robin. Yes, clever old me. But let's not forget that I too was clever earlier when I changed a bread shop into a fish shop. Do you remember how clever I was? Let's do that line again, shall we? The line about how clever I am? No, the line about the eggs, Ray. Oh, why? Ray. Oh, OK. Let's do Robin's clever line again, shall we? Are you sure you want some eggs, sir? Why do you ask? Are they infected with salmonella? No, it's just that you've gone and put your elbows in them. Right, well, that's the end of that exercise. And relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, you enjoyed that, Gordon. Good, so did I. <laughs> Theatre Shop. I'm glad they're doing a new series. I was worried last week when it was the last in the old series. A good start, Ray and Robin. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to announce the two lucky viewers who've been chosen to go to Paris to be the United Kingdom contingency on the voting panel of the fourth international film festival and that's happening in this summer there'll be 15 countries taking part and they will spend their time viewing films and seeing the sights of one of the most beautiful cities in the world paris there it is notre dame i could tell no that was never tell it was the arc de triomphe notre dame <laughs> well at least you know it's paris now don't you it really is i promise you at the rue rivoli i think so yeah oh I wish I was going. Well, we had a letter from one of the winners last year, just to give you an idea of, uh, of what happened and how it all turned out. I'm writing to thank you very much for having given me this marvellous opportunity. I've made 29 new friends from all over the world, and in addition, I have, I hope, improved my French. I've been lucky enough to see some wonderful films and have been able to judge them and reward them with the best prizes. And she says, also, thank you again for choosing me to go to Paris for what I consider to have been one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. And that was from one of last year's lucky winners. That was Claire Garrity. Well, glad you enjoyed yourself, Claire. There she is. Well, it was interesting that uh, the people who entered this year's competition, they chose three films mainly to review. And the most popular were Moonwalker, starring Michael Jackson, Cocktail, starring Tom Cruise, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit with the wonderful Bob Hoskins. But now it's time to announce the winners, and they are Lee Griffiths from Northern Ireland and Jason Treadwell from Kent. You are the ones who will be going to Paris this summer and seeing all those films and representing Great Britain in the fourth 
Paris Film Festival. Well, don't worry if you entered and you didn't win, because you still have a chance of winning a fabulous trip to London to come along to the SOS Star Awards here at BBC Television Centre, and that will be on Sunday, the 14th of May. Now, all you have to do is vote, and you stand a chance of winning that trip to London. Now, what we wanted you to do is to vote for your favourites. Here are all the categories that we'd like you to vote for. The funniest TV programme, the favourite expert, the top pop act, the favourite man on TV, the favourite woman on TV, the top sports star, favourite TV programme, and the SOS Special Award. Now, if you'd like to vote, then please send us a large stamped addressed envelope to Going Live, BBC TV Centre, London W12 8QT, and we will send you a voting form in return. Well, I'm a bit worried because uh, the girls, Fuzzbox, they were meant to be in the studio by now. Well, they haven't turned up. I'm going to track them down. You look at the video in the meantime. It's International Rescue. <laughs> Tina, Maggie, Vicky, Joe, welcome back. Welcome Hi. to Thank you. Center and welcome to Going Live. God, it's ages since I've seen you. Yes. <laughs> what have you been up to in the last three years? Um, we've been writing songs and we went to Europe and America. And how did you enjoy that? Well, it was an experience and it's really, really hectic because touring always is, but it's usually quite good fun. Now, I have heard rumours <laughs> that you've all been getting rather good at playing musical instruments now. <laughs> uh, yes, it used to be your claim to fame that, you know, people really it's resented the fact that you were successful rumor, because you could... I think. Oh, <laughs> so good. So you're not breaking the habit of a lifetime. It's certainly not. Oh, good, good to know. No. Now, that video is terrific. Now, we on Going Live are great fans of Thunderbirds and all sorts of science fiction type things like that. Who did you get to play? Now, do you say Duran Duran or Duran Duran? Duran well, that, Duran. Yeah. Who did you get to play the part of Duran Duran? Adrian Edmondson. He is unrecognisable. <laughs> How did you manage to get him involved? Um, well, he actually directed it, Ooh. and um, we were very pleased that he said he'd be in it as well. We thought, you know, great. <laughs> it, it, it really does work very well. So what, what are your plans now? What's next? Well, we're writing an LP. Well, we've written the LP. We're recording the LP at the moment. Um, just loads of promotion and hopefully doing as well as possible with this single. Yeah. Is, this, then... a, is this the theme, though, that goes throughout the album? Well, no, there's a, there's a couple of... Well, there's one more, to be honest. <laughs> one more sort of um, spacey orientated song. But then there's a whole variety of things on the album. I just have to, I've just noticed something on here. In the, can you see the epaulettes on, that the girls have got? <laughs> They've got two sorts of epaulettes. One's covered in buttons. Right, now, are these lipsticks in here? Well, they're not actually <laughs> lipsticks, they're just the holders. <laughs> yeah, they're so muscly and strong. Oh, they're, they're terrific. They are, that's a good idea. For an Have emergency, I? you know. Well, you, and the girl we never knows. Know. She's sitting on the wings of a red arrow. You just may need to touch up that <laughs> lipstick. Absolutely. Now, you have got a competition. You've got a great prize. Let's have a look at the prize, right. first of all. Da, 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 da. <laughs> it's one Lovely. of these Fabo jackets. Has made specially for some lucky, lucky viewer. And I can tell you the girls have spent hours sewing on every button by hand. We What's have. the question? Yeah. Right then, the question is, who is famous for saying, yes, my lady? But I can't what do a very good impression. What member of Thunderbirds that is? Well, I recognise it. I thought it was a jolly yes. good. Answer on a postcard, please, <laughs> to Going Live, BBC TV Centre, London, W12 8QT. Thanks, girls. Good luck Thank with the you. single. Let's stay with Thunderbirds now because Philip Schofield loves Thunderbirds. In fact, some would say that he even looks like a Thunderbird. Okay. Have a look at this. Don't you think he looks the spitting image of Scott Tracy? <laughs> Virgil, to see you landing okay. The system's ready for takeoff. ADF, nav. That's good. I just speak to our friends. Good afternoon to them. 
afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain, Peter Schofield, speaking here on behalf of myself and co-pilot Virgil Tracy. I'd like to welcome you on aboard this uh, British Airways flight to not very far. Made it all up. Not going anywhere. Not even turned on. But if you are a budding pilot, or you think you'd like to be a pilot for British Airways, a bit late for me now, but not for you, boy or girl. Thankfully, it makes no difference these days. And British Airways run their own training scheme for such budding pilots. And this is where they come. This is the British Aerospace Flying College. We're in Presswick in Scotland. And British Airways send their cadets here, hopefully with no experience whatsoever, and by the end of about 16 months, they're qualified airline pilots who are ready to go online. Now, I'm here for two days and won't be qualified to go on anything at all. For the student pilots, training starts in the classroom. They don't even see an aeroplane for the first eight weeks. These periods of ground training are spent learning about the weather, aircraft systems, radio communications, and aviation engineering. It's an important area of a pilot's training and goes hand in hand with the flying lessons that follow. They also find out what the dickens all these dials and switches do. I've been left on my own to explore. This is the ops room. This is where the pilots would come in and check the weather, make sure their plane is available, and make sure that they're on the right route for the weather conditions, no dangers, all that sort of business. Decide where they're gonna go, get authorization. We're here, by the way. I'm going over here. Out on the airstrip, cadet pilots are being put through their flying paces, which was where I met the chief ground instructor at the college, Brian Blythe. Well, the first aircraft we start off on is the AS-202 Bravo, which is built in Switzerland. We do 50 hours in that aircraft. The reason we use this aircraft is it's a fully aerobatic aircraft. It can fall plus 6 to minus 3G, which is quite enough for most people. We bring, the, bring breakfast up anyway. <laughs> um, the machine is a very, very good little machine. It's a very sturdy machine, and it allows us to do the whole of the general handling uh, portion of the training. After we've done 50 hours in that, we then progress onto the Piper Warrior. Very much uh, lower stress aircraft, built very much lighter framing, and consequently the cost is somewhat less. Yeah. The aircraft is uh, used in the intermediate stage, and we do 105 hours of flying this monotonous to some extent, but it's a re requirement of the license that we have to complete a certain number of hours in the single engine aircraft. This aircraft is in fact the logical step, the intermediate step between the Bravo and the Seneca 3. Right, Philip, this is the Piper Seneca, which we talked about outside. This aircraft is equipped for instrument flying and is the final stage of the students' training. The entire equipment you see here is replicated in the simulator to which we'll move now. Oh, right, right. This is impressive. <laughs> this is the Piper Seneca simulator. Uh -huh. I'm going to hand you over now to Captain Keith Jones, who you'll find inside the simulator. So if you would just go through the door and straight through in between the two seats. Thank you, Brian. Okay. He's right. in it, is he? Yes. <laughs> Hello there. It's not an easy one to get into, this, is it? Hi, kid, how are you? Hi, Phil. <laughs> excuse, excuse me, just scrambling in. Right. OK, welcome. Headset on. Got the engines running now, and all we're going to do is ready for takeoff. And all you need to do, if we get your seat comfortable, is there the throttles. Yeah. So your right hand on the throttles, uh -huh. and your left hand on the control wheel, and we set the power. Okay, so just move the throttles fully forward. Yeah, the engine's winding up now. Yeah, right the way forward. Well, about that's that's fine. That'll yeah. be fine. I'll just put, finish it off for you. Okay, when the engine's now ready for takeoff, we just press the brakes, the tow brakes. Can you reach and release the parking catch? The parking catch is over on the other side there. Can you see it down there? here? Just push it in. There we go. Now the simulator is working and you can see the speed is starting to increase. Yeah. Which is that instrument over there. Yeah. And in a few minutes you're going to start to pull back for takeoff. So now pull it back and you'll 
feel it getting to the air. About there. Right. And that's it. Okay. And I'll just help you correct it a little bit. That's fine. It are flying. Passing 700 feet and accelerating to our normal climb speed. So after a quick lesson in the simulator, I felt it was about time to reach for the skies and try the real thing. Right, you wouldn't mind if you took off and landed this No, time, I'll do that. I, yeah. I think I hit fairly hard last time, but I wouldn't like to do it in one that was actually okay. real. Well, here's the cylinder <coughs> anyway. In you go, Phil. Okay, nice. Thanks. simulation, lots of flying, and finally when you know that you've got this master, then you know that you're well on your way to a, Absolutely. a flying job. That's right, and a flying star as well, a very good career ahead of you. Yeah. Do I want to fly? Do I want to fly? It? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> put your hands and feet on the controls, right. and there you are. Figure out what So, that's it. Right. If you look out the front, you can see the nose moving up and down. So there you have it. After 16 months at the college, you could eventually find yourself here on the flight deck of a jumbo jet as the first officer. Food for thought? But I'm afraid I can't talk to you anymore because Virgil and I have got a lot to do. We're flying out at the moment, so, so hand it over to me, Virgil. Can I have it? Thank you very much. Oh, I've got it. Yes, that's good. I have it here. And here it is in front of me. And down we go. Ah, oh, it's terrific. What stirring stuff. Good Lord, actually, we're over, we're over here. Huh? Did you wonder what that was? I will explain to you in a minute. Well done, Philip. That was brilliant. What brilliant. stirring stuff. Welcome Hi, to Growing Sarah. Live, Richard. Good, nice good to see you again. Nice to see you. Now, the last time you were here, um, we had a look at Sarah's banana, banana plant. plant. I showed you how to grow bananas from seed. Sarah was named, and one day, Philip gave her a big, sloppy kiss. We wondered what on earth was going to happen uh, to it. And, uh, and look at it now. Now that was the, that, that was the oh, original hey, one. There sorry. we are before. That's before. <laughs> Philip got his lips and on then it. Philip kissed it. <laughs> right now. And now look at it. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Unless you want to grow at this rate, keep away from Philip Schofield, or at least don't let him kiss you, because you too will grow <laughs> six feet, <laughs> six months. <laughs> Good <laughs> lord! But well done with that, That's Richard. Great, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well done, Philip again. Yes. <laughs> We've got an array of plants, plants here, yeah. but we've got some peanuts down well, here. Do you What's like all peanuts, this about? Sarah? I do. In fact, well, I've been holding myself back from nicking them off the plate. Because some of these have been disappearing at a rapid rate. Yes. Now, <laughs> peanuts, you can actually grow on your own windowsills very easily, and it's great fun. Now, all you have to do is go along to the supermarket and buy some unroasted peanuts in their, in in their, their shells. shells. And if you open up a peanut, you'd see two peanuts inside and there they are there. They're the actual seeds. They're the actual they? seeds of the peanut. Right. Now, using our empty going live yoghurt pot. <laughs> <laughs> make, I don't know where you can get those actually. Makes, but an ordinary yoghurt or, pot will ordinary do. Ordinary yoghurt pot. Make some small holes in the bottom for drainage and then fill it with potting compost and then take one seed and place it about two inches deep in the soil, cover it over, water it, 
gently and then make a mini greenhouse by covering with a polythene bag and securing in place with an elastic band. How long will it be before you see? It only takes about three to five days come and out. then the shoots appear. And then after about three weeks, you've got a plant about this big. You take, your, you take you, the, the plastic bag yeah, off then? Yeah, take the plastic bag off then. Then let it grow a tiny bit, then pot it on to, into a six inch pot. And then it looks like a sort of giant floppy, bit of an untidy clover plant. That's what it is. I was wondering yeah. what that reminded but me But then of. the amazing thing happens. It produces small yellow flowers. And from the flowers, little shoots appear and make their way down into the ground. And I think we've got a picture of this. There we are. Oh, that See little that? sort of yellow sh yeah. shoot there. And now the that's shoot. going down into a separate jar there, I did that to, just to illustrate what happens. And it grows down into the soil and actually produces peanuts underground. So if you were to go ahead and plant a little peanut this afternoon, yeah. how long would it be before you could have a, your first crop? You'll be eating your own peanuts in September. Not enough for peanut butter, my <laughs> favourite. <laughs> but you'll get a nice little crop of peanuts for September. Now, I know that you've produced a fact sheet yeah, it's got for, for planting peanuts. peanuts. How to start them off, how to grow them, and how to crop your own peanuts. We'll give you the address and the details for that in a minute. But before that, we have got some very well, amazing looking plants over here. If you think they're here. amazing, these are my favourites. The insect eaters. These are incredible plants because in nature, they grow in soil and conditions that's got little food, so they've had to adapt to catch their own food. And you can actually get some traps that are so big that they actually catch sort of gopher-like creatures that big. But I didn't bring that one in. I thought oh, it was unfair. Uh, 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 leave those in their the, part of the world. I brought the safe ones in. These no. little ones. Oh, oh, oh Gordon, oh, Gordon. It's OK, Gordon. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Um, These ones are too small to catch you. So I brought in some plants that you can grow very easily on your own windowsill. And the first one is the Venus flytrap, which is the famous one that everybody knows, but this is a very easy plant to grow. And at the end of the leaf, this great big jaw with teeth. And it's a very clever plant because it produces food in the centre of the leaf. So it doesn't actually wait for a fly to come along and perhaps land on it. It attracts the and fly. And just sort of reach up and sort of snap and then, hold of now, it. Now, with any luck... So that, that's sort of tasty in there, is it, yeah. for a fly? And the fly lands in there, and there are little, little hairs in there. And if you hit a hair twice, Within 15 seconds, the trap closes oh. up. Look at that. Isn't that great? <laughs> and then it's trapped, it's caught, and the little trap takes three days to eat the fly. I mean, does it chomp away in there? How well, does it, it actually, eat it? It's just like your stomach. It, it, it sort of uses little juices and, and dissolves the fly. And all the bits it doesn't like, at the end of three days, the trap opens up, and all the bits it doesn't like are left behind. All now, the bones. I mean, there aren't many plants that are carnivores, as it were. Right. What, what, why is it that these particular plants need to eat? Because the soil, the conditions they're in, there isn't enough food, so they've had to adapt right. just to catch the food. Oh, I very, see. very clever. Now, what this is, this, these, now these, the next two, and this one particularly, looks like an underwater plant and This to looks me. very pretty. Actually, it's called a sundew, because if you can see at the end of the little tips, there are little blobs of what looks like dew, but if you just touch in there and see what happens... Can you oh, yes, it is. It's sort of sticky, sticky, isn't it? It and doesn't look big enough to be able to catch a well, fly. It actually catches small insects most of the time, and the small insect lands on it and is actually sort of eaten by that liquid, dissolves it. But if a big insect lands on it, it's incredible what happens. The, the fly sort of struggles to get free, and slowly the tentacles wrap around the plant and actually traps it like an octopus. Oh, that's it's cruel. Amazing. So there it is on your window, on your windowsill, on your windowsill yeah. and the fly is struggling there, its legs sort of and then, like a little Wiggling octopus, around. it goes around and catches the fly. Not the sort of thing for breakfast time conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, now well, this one really does look like an this underwater this plant to me. If you want a plant that's going to catch flies or wasps on your windowsill all summer long, this is the ecological alternative to fly sprays. It's the safe fly catcher. It's called the pitcher plant. What's happened is the leaf has gradually grown up, turned round and formed itself into a hollow tube with a little frilled umbrella at the top to keep the rain off. And what happens is the flies come along and there's some little food in the, just at the top of the picture and the fly lands on it, starts eating it. Then it discovers there's more food as it works its way down. So greedily it sort of works its way down, eating more and more food and suddenly it finds it hasn't got a footing. It's like a slippery as glass and it just slips down to the bottom of the tube. Tricky old pitcher plant. Clever little thing. And actually this has also got a wonderful flower. I think we've got a picture of There we are. Look at that flower. And how, how many times a year does that flower that come out? That flowers once a year. Isn't that pretty? Now, these are, they look and sound very exotic plants. Yeah. Are they difficult to take care of? You know, they're about the easiest of all plants to grow in your windowsill. All they need is a sunny windowsill, and then they need to be kept moist. And the best way of keeping them moist is actually put the plant in a saucer of rainwater and just keep the saucer topped up 
through the year with rainwater. Not tap water. Not tap water. Rainwater is okay. softer. If you haven't got rainwater, you can boil up water in the kettle, let it cool down and use that. Now, about the fact sheet. You've got well, about yeah. the peanut planting and, and also, also about these insect eaters. It's eating a really plants. great one on the insect eaters because we've got where to get insect eaters from, how to grow them, and some lovely experiments to try as well. Terrific. So it's a great fact well, sheet. if you would like that fact sheet, then send us a stamped address envelope to Going Live, BBC TV Centre, London, W12. 8QT. Richard, thank you very thank much you. for coming into Growing Live this morning. Nice to see Great you again. Fun. Thanks. Now, I think it's time for a break. Enough of that. This program never stops. That's it. Get rid of the grubby old music because we've had some more videos now. It's Robin Beck, Save All Your Tears. <laughs> Great stuff. We are from Robin Beck. I don't think there's a commercial that goes with that one. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, hush your mouth. <laughs> Andy's back, and of course, we asked you to pick the person that you thought looked most like Andy Crane. So, poor soul. <laughs> have a look at these, right? Have a look at these. First of all, in last <laughs> place, <laughs> in last place, the person who looked least like Andy Crane, according to you, was in fact. Andy Crane. That's, that's me, that. Which and just to prove it, I got my jacket here. Look, you see? You didn't actually get a proper shot of it. You didn't get a full frame to Did open it. Did we darken it, your hair down a little bit? It was great, yeah. They had darkened the hair, you know, get a bit of a tan. I looked healthier than I've ever looked in my life. They had, like dark makeup on and stuff. It was absolutely <laughs> butch. Moving up the line, we can see that in fifth place, number two uh, mm -hmm. was in fifth place. That was Stuart McPhail, and he got 800 votes. I think Andy Crane got about four votes, the girls were telling me in the back. <laughs> he got about 200, actually. Votes. The real Andy Crane got 200. Oh, 200. All right, Stuart fine. beat you. <laughs> 800. All right, moving, moving up. <laughs> in fourth place was number six. <laughs> the metal... Yeah, oh, yes, very funny. The yeah, metal thank crane you very much. got 920 <laughs> votes, as opposed to the real crane, who got, as I said, 200. So 920 for the metal crane. Oh, Stuart. <laughs> in third place was number one, uh, with... 1,280 votes, 1,280, that's Daryl Morris. I think Daryl looks like Boris Becker. I thought he looked a bit more like Boris Becker than me, don't you think so? You think he looks a bit like Boris Becker? I think he looks a little bit like Gonch out of Grange Hill as well. I mean, just a little bit. Who was in earlier on this morning? I thought, I don't know. In second place, number five with 2,960, Mark Sinkinson. That's a lot, that's high, that's high votes. It's a squillions of votes, isn't But it? the winner. The winner with 3,380 votes, Andrew Radcliffe, Rawcliffe. <laughs> well done, Andrew. He got 3,380. Now, what's his prize? Congratulations. His prize is to come down to Television Centre here in London and spend the day with us in the broom cupboard. And, I mean, you never know. You might get on and do a bit and, like, nobody be able to tell the... I could have the day off, couldn't well, you I? Could if you get Andrew down here... You could do, considering could do you only stuff. got 200. And he got 3,000 votes. He looks more like me than I do. That's great. <laughs> right, let's do the brief competition. That was, uh, that was last week. Um, if you would like to dig a winner out of there for us... It wasn't in the script, this bit, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Oh, well, there you go. You see, you, know, you, have, to, you have to be able to add-lib on here. Absolutely. <laughs> What was, all the, this up. what was the question? He's a losing control this program. It's slipping away from my fingers. Right, the question was... Oh, what was Breed's second hit in America, presumably? That was it. Because that's what it says here. What was Breed's second hit in the States? The, the, uh, the prizes, of course, there were signed records, singles, albums, all that sort of business, and this fabo guitar. There you are. Oh, here we go. Look, here we go. I'll bet I'm in the microphone. It was actually written on this guitar. Can't do an E. Oh, dear. E. Breed, second hit in America was How Can I Fall? Congratulations. Go on, carry on. Congratulations That's to the right Joan right? Milton, who lives in Morrisha in Scotland. So congratulations to you. All these goodies are on the way. If you can't play the guitar by now, then with a bit of luck, you'll be able to learn. Andy, thank you very much indeed. Don't give up your day job. <laughs> and uh, thanks very much indeed for you're, not looking anything like you. You're very welcome, and thanks very much for having me, and thanks very much for voting for the metal crane. We're actually going to enter the very nerve centre of going live. That's right, we're just about to go into the gallery. Yes, it's called the gallery, but of course, you're not going to see any paintings or sculptures in this gallery. Oh. <laughs> Trev! What? Right, well, 
as I was saying, this is the very nerve center. And we're very nervous. Now, as you can see, everybody's concentrating, and we mustn't disturb them. So we're just going to sort of stand here and see what's going on. It's really boring, isn't it? <laughs> impressive technology, though, don't you think? Yeah, Trev, what do you think is the most impressive piece of technology to date? The most impressive piece? I'd say the, the compact disc. The compact disc? Yeah. Oh, why? Well, think about it. You can drop them, mm -hmm. you can scratch them, you can get them wet. Yeah, but most people just play them, don't they? So it's a bit of a waste. Yeah. What's your favourite piece of technology, then? Oh, uh, food processor. Really? Mm -hmm. They're bad for your eyes, though. Right? They're bad for your eyes, those VDU screens. No, no, no. I said food processor, not word processor. Oh. <laughs> I've always called them blenders. Sure, you can't type information into a blender. <laughs> yeah, but you can't make soup in a word processor. Yes, you can. Eh? <laughs> alphabet soup. What? <gasps> alphabet soup. You can make alphabet soup. <laughs> What's that? Alphabet soup? Yeah. I don't know. I just thought it was a funny thing to say. I don't know. Julia, you're the director. Do you think that was a funny thing to say? No, Trev. Angela, is the Trev. producer. Trev. Is the producer, do you think alphabet soup was a funny thing to say? No. Does anyone in here think oh, alphabet soup on. was a funny thing to say? No, Trev. Hey, see, Trev? Um, Simon? Okay, here we go. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Can we watch the press conference then? Would you please welcome today's press conference guest, Dr. Alan Marion Davis. Alan, welcome to the hot seat. Many questions. We'll start with one from Julietta. Actually, that's in the studio, not on the phone. <laughs> Julietta? Do you think we have to worry about our diet so early on in our life? Yes, it's a good idea to start really young thinking about the diet because some of the diseases that are bad diets associated with, like heart disease, for instance, can begin to happen early in life. I don't mean you get heart attacks early in life, but what happens is that the, the fatty substances get laid down in the, in the arteries quite, at quite a young age. So it's a good idea to get started really early. And of course, habits you get to when you start young tend to stay on as you get older. So yes, the, the sooner the better, really. Good idea. Okay, and onto the telephones. And line one. Ah. Hello, who's on line one? Samira. Hello, Samira, how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Off you go with your question. Okay. Is it true that potato skins are dangerous to eat? Potato skins? Yeah. Yes. Yes, well, there's a bit of a worry about some substances with potato skins, um, but I don't think you need to worry too much about uh, potato skins unless the skins are green. In fact, potato skins um, in a potato which is well matured, which is most potatoes, like potatoes in their jackets, for instance, um, you, that's actually a very good thing because there's lots of fibre in that, so it's a good idea to have your potatoes with skins on. The only ones you need to be a bit careful about are the ones where the skin is green. What's Peel the, that off and throw that what's away. What's the problem there? Why? Well, there are certain um, uh, chemical substances is in there, not sprayed on, natural substances, uh, which uh, can upset your tummy. So, so they, they can make you feel a bit sort of bit ill. So if the, if, the, if the potato's a bit green, just peel it off and throw that away. But if it's a mature potato, the skins are actually very good for you because they've got lots of fibre in. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Samira. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ricky. Ricky. Oh, Hello, Ricky. Oh, fast foods bad for you and is it all right to eat them sometimes? Yeah, fast, fast foods are not particularly bad for you. What tends to happen is that some fast foods uh, are fried. That's the problem, because it's a quick way of cooking, you see. And with fried foods, you get a lot of fat in the food. And uh, as we saw earlier on, a lot of the, the children are eating far too many fried foods, far too many fatty foods. So that's not a good idea. But I mean, there are plenty of fast foods which aren't particularly fatty. And uh, as long as you get a good balance of foods in your diet, you know, with lots of fruit and, and fresh vegetables and things like that, then there's nothing wrong with fast foods particularly. What would you say is the ideal fast food to eat then that's going to do you the least amount of harm? Well, supposing you like a burger. Well, I like yeah. a burger. <laughs> Who doesn't like a burger? Well, if you have a burger which is, uh, which is it's cooked in... As, as little fat as possible, and which is in a wholemeal uh, bun, and which has sal salad and things like that attached to it as well, then that is, is really quite a, quite a good meal. It's quite a nice balanced meal, even just, just in, in a bun there. So as long as it's not too much, as long as it's not dripping in fat, that's the problem. And not too, much not too many sugary things, sugary sauces and sugary drinks. Right. And back to the telephones. Line two. Hello, line two. Hello. And who's on there? Michelle Owen. Hello, Michelle. Off you go. 
Why do why have they already started to bring out the problem of salmonella in eggs when it's been going round a long time? That's a very good question, Michelle, yes. Well, the reason for that is that, as, as you say, it's been going around a long time. In fact, it's been getting worse over the last few years. And, oh, about a year ago now, um, the medical, um, sort of medical people got onto it in a big way. But it wasn't really until Mrs. Curry came on the, on the telly and sort of took the lid off the whole thing that suddenly the press got hold of it. And you know how the press can get onto something, they get their teeth into something and really go for it. Well, that's what they did with Salmonella and with, or with Mrs. Curry, perhaps. And uh, the whole thing suddenly got plastered all over the paper and it was, became a big issue and suddenly we all became aware of it but it, you're quite right it's been brewing for some time and it's been a problem that the uh, Ministry of Agriculture has been trying to grapple with uh, for a long time now so as a professional um, how bad is the problem it's 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 bad in the sense that um, you know it's something which should be should be dealt with well, after you don't want to feel unsafe about eating chickens you know and eating eggs we should you should feel safe about that and there's certainly a problem there it's not just in this country it's it's all over the place where chickens are uh, are bred in, in large numbers. Um, I think you know what's got to what's got to be done is they've, they've got to look very closely at the hygiene within these these large chicken chicken places, these broiler places and egg laying places, and also look at the feed because one of the problems is that they they f the, the, they feed chickens on actually the dead remains of other chickens, and of course that creates a, a circular problem. So it's a real thing that's got to be looked into and sorted out. Okay. Thank you, Shirley. Where's Shirley? Yeah. <coughs> if you're a vegetarian, how would you feel about eating soft cheeses and eggs as part of your important diet? I think they're very, very good things to eat as part of as part of your diet, but soft cheeses and eggs. Um, you know, there's been a, there's been a worry about eggs, but it's it's only really raw eggs that are, that have caused the concern. If the eggs cooked, that's fine. There's no problem there. And even with a raw egg, the chances of getting a, a salmonella are really small. Um, and it's only perhaps very old and frail people and pregnant women perhaps who need to concern themselves about raw eggs. So I think for the for, you know, people here, for most people, don't have to worry about that. And with the soft cheeses, again, it's very unusual to get some problem with soft cheeses. I think you should carry on. They're, they're both lovely things to eat, so keep on eating them. You end up in a situation where uh, constantly reading newspapers, listening to news reports, you sit at home thinking, what? Well, is there actually anything that's safe to eat? Because it would appear that, I don't know whether it's how much is bandwagon or what, but, but at one stage, two or three weeks ago, it would appear that everything was unsafe. I know, I know, you're quite right. I mean, I, I think it's a great shame, you know, when, when the thing gets where it's shaken up like that by the press, you know, we, we're all so frightened to move, and everything is, un you think everything is unhealthy, you know, you think life, <laughs> life can't be worth living. And it's such a silly thing, that, because we don't have to get that anxious about our food. On the whole, the food in this country is very wholesome indeed. There's a wonderful range of foods there. You go around the supermarket, these days and there are lots of really healthy healthy foods to eat and you don't have to get neurotic about it as long as you know what you're eating which is a good thing we're getting interested in food and that's a good thing we know what we're eating and if we choose our foods carefully in a nice balanced way we'll be fine hmm. Francis has the problem of listeria in soft cheeses been exaggerated because of the fuss of salmonella I think you're right. I think it probably has. I think what's that? You know, it's the old man bite, bites dog syndrome, which is the, which is the, when a newspaper, newspaper has a headline, man bites dog, suddenly every newspaper's got, you know, got the same story. And I think this is what happened with the, with the food business. Because of salmonella, there was a lot of interest, a lot of public interest in it. And I think what's happened is that they've jumped on the bandwagon, as Philip was saying there. And, uh, okay, there is a bit of a problem in some soft, soft, soft cheeses, but very, very occasionally, very, very rarely. And I really don't think you need to worry about it. Okay. And line three. Uh, who's on three? Abinda Sabota. Hello, Abinda. Off you go. Um, do you still eat eggs? Do I still eat eggs? Yeah. Oh, I certainly do. Yes, love them. Wonderful things. <laughs> what about the cooking of eggs? Yeah, which way do you like them, Alan? I, I, I actually like them so, I, done softly. I love soft scrambled eggs. The softer, the better, really. And I like omelettes as well. Um, and hard-boiled eggs. Um, I actually, uh, very occasionally, uh, have um, a raw egg, you know, just mixed up in, uh, as a drink, but it's a strange thing to do. Um, I think that, th I think people have to perhaps start, start being a bit careful about raw eggs, I suppose, but I don't, as I said earlier on, I really don't think that, uh, that uh, people, unless they are very old and frail or pregnant, need to worry about raw eggs. I mean, I think you have your eggs any way you want them, sunny side up, sunny side down, fried, scrambled, boiled, Whatever you like, they're, they're, all, they're pretty safe. Thank you very much for your call. Thank you. Yeah. Mark. Do you think that too many chemicals are used in food production nowadays? I need to put the phone up to my ears. <laughs> I'm getting confused with all this yeah. te technology. That's a real mark over there. Um, 
I think that, that quite, a lot, quite a lot of foods these days um, do have a, a fair amount of, use chemicals as an emotive word, but, uh, word, but there's a, a lot of technology goes into them. Um, yes, there are various additives put in. I think the food industry has taken liberties over the last few years, cutting their, you know, cutting their costs, increasing their profit margins by making food look bigger, last longer, and all the rest of it. And I think the, the chickens are coming home to roost, I was going to say. Would, <laughs> I think, you know... The, the, would, would you encourage organic food, then? I, I would encourage organic food. Not as a, it used to be a cranky thing, but I think the crankiness has now gone with organic food. I think more and more people realise that it, it is much more wholesome. I'm worried about, for instance, what they're spraying on the food. Uh, not so much in the factories where they put it together, but what they spray in the fields. Because some of those chemicals that go on the food that's being grown um, can, can last on the food for quite a long time. So I'm a bit concerned about that. But at the same time, I think that uh, you don't, we don't have to get too worried about it because, again, that they're onto this now. They're watching this very closely and monitoring it closely. And so I don't think you need to worry too much about that. But I think it's something that has to be, has to be kept an eye on. Does productivity go down if you grow something organically? I mean, it's like having free-range hens that have got a lot more space rather than in that little battery hens in the same space. Do, 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 does the productivity decrease? It does, really. It's, it is definitely more expensive, more labour-intensive to make the food that way. Um, and the productivity does come down, so it becomes a higher-priced product. So you do have to pay more for it, which is a shame. But I think more and more people are prepared to pay more for something which they, which they think has been grown organically or, or done with a minimum of, of chemical additives. So yes, it does add to the price, but then I think it's worth it. And perhaps we can find ways of it not being so expensive. Perhaps that's where the, well, those pressure groups that we were talking about earlier on. Um, let's go to Alan now. What takes our sport are good for you to keep fit? What, good, what are good sports? Yeah. What you want to do is something that you enjoy doing because the most important thing about keeping fit is that you keep keeping fit. You know, you do it for a long time. So you can't put fitness in the bank. It just melts away in three months if you, if, you, if you don't keep going. So always do something which you enjoy doing, which is good for all-round fitness, for your stamina, which means you've got to get breathless for a bit, and for your strength, which means you've got to uh, move against resistance, lift a few weights. I don't mean literally weights, but I mean do something which keeps your strength up, and suppleness, which makes all your limbs move about. If you do all those three things and keep at it because it's fun and you enjoy it, then that'll keep you in shape. Just, uh, just very briefly, um, Alan, are we heading in the right direction as a nation now? Are we doing it right? Are more people aware? Yes, I think we are. We're getting more health aware. People are looking to, to looking after their bodies and keeping them in shape. Um, and if you look at the figures of, of, of sort of the numbers of people dying, um, you know things are improving. There's no doubt about it. We're actually getting becoming a healthier country. So uh, I think that the omens are looking quite good. We mustn't get neurotic about it. You can worry yourself. Uh, to death worrying about being healthy you know let's keep a nice balanced open mind about it but i think we're going in the right direction Good. and thank you very much indeed for uh, for being our press conference yes, guest this you. morning excellent thank very you. interesting very Pleasure. interesting We've got masses of calls it's always such a shame we do run out of time but next week we have to talk about next week and uh, stephen hendry snooker player he'll be on the program and deacon blue are back with us at last they'll be with us next week john craven will be having a look behind the scenes of bbc television news Eric Idle, Monty Python star, he'll be with us. And don't forget, also, we have the second part of our exciting cartoon, Visionaries. We'll see you next week. Don't be late. Here's the Reynolds girls, and I'd rather Bye. Be back. Bye Unveiled the new Radio Times. Everybody needs good the whiz kids of ours. What makes Madge's kind of day? Meet those stars from the continent down under. They're on the up and up. Down under, up front. With the first of a three parter who done it to get you on the Orient Express. Radio Times. Out now.
In just a few minutes on BBC One, Desmond Lynham introduces rugby league, ice hockey, indoor bowls, racing from Chepstow and a look ahead to the Cheltenham Festival. First we'll hear about the weather prospects from Bill Giles. A very good afternoon to you. Well, really not too bad a day today in many parts. We can see on the satellite picture, though, there is a bit of cloud down to the south, but that's really going to gradually thin away, I think, as we go through the afternoon into the evening. But a lumpy shower cloud up in northern areas, but in the middle, really not too bad at all. The winds, a bit on the strong side in the far north, they could get up to gale force later on, but down over southern areas, quite a gentle wind, and quite high temperatures too, up to about 11 degrees Celsius, 52 Fahrenheit, but as you can see, a bit cooler than that up in the windy northern parts, 8 Celsius, for instance, 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, for the rugby league at Wigan today, not a bad day, up to 10 degrees Celsius, bit of sunshine around too. The breeze a little bit on the strong side from the southwest, but uh, for the racing at Chepstow, and remember, you can see both of these on grandstand after this program, the sunshine a bit on the hazy side, but reasonably warm, and indeed dry. I think might be just the outside chance of a shower, but let's forget it. Most of the country then, really not a bad day. One or two showers dotted around, but uh, most places, as you can see, they're dry with a fair amount of sunshine around. Although coming further south, uh, the sunshine becomes more and more hazy. And certainly running through the channel, up through on the uh, southern coastal counties, the cloud just thick enough to give the odd spot or two of rain, but really not amounting to very much. Now, most of the rain today in the form of showers in the northern part of Ireland, up through western parts of Scotland. Some of those showers turning out to be quite heavy, some hail and thunder mixed in them too. And I think as we go through tonight, they could well be merging later on, particularly in northwest Scotland, into some longer spells of rain. And that's going to herald rain coming southwards through tomorrow. Down over most places, though, dry and clear, so uh, a few mist and fog patches around. And indeed, in one or two places, the temperature's just dropping down close to freezing. In the far northwest, though, uh, no fog or frost. The wind's freshening up there because uh, we've got the weather map for 6 o'clock tomorrow showing this low pressure area, showing the fronts, which will be giving some wet and windy weather, and they'll be swinging their way southeastwards through tomorrow. After saying that, though, a dry, bright start, a good deal of sunshine on the eastern side of England, but this rain pushing its way southeastwards as we go through the day so that by the end of the afternoon, down to all but the extreme southeastern parts, and some of that rain's going to turn out to be pretty heavy and uh, perhaps turning to a bit of snow over the mountains later on. And then brighter weather feeding its way in. A very mild day just about everywhere again, but windy, particularly in the west there. Well, that's just about it from me. Bye-bye for now. Now on BBC One at 12.15, it's time for our regular Saturday sporting rendezvous with Desmond Lynham in Grandstand. Rugby League's big showpiece occasion at Wembley, the Challenge Cup final, is fast approaching. And today, one team should book their place. St Helens take on Widnes in the first semi-final. The clubs have already met in cup competition this season. Widnes were narrow winners then, with Martin Afire, the game's top try scorer, in splendid form. Richard Ayres, he's looking for a fire now then, there's the pace, there's nobody will catch this lad, it's a formality, it's like shooting a bullet from a gun when a fire gets it. Les Quirk was the star for St Helens on that occasion. Beaver. Barber, that's a good ball, he's got Lachlan, Quirk, he must be in, he's in, oh yes! Les Quirk and Martin Afire in opposition again today. 
St. Helens coach Alex Murphy, usually a member of our commentary team, will be encouraging his side in that quiet, introverted style of his. So, Peter Fox joins Ray French to bring you St. Helens against Widnes live, 3 o'clock. Desert Orchid is without doubt the most popular horse in the country. We look ahead to his chances in the Cheltenham Gold Cup. This charter party by a length and a half from Cavie's Crown at the final fence. Charter party lands in the lead. Cavie's Crown second. Bow Ranger jumps in third. Charter party striding away now from Cavie's Crown and at the line. Charter party wins the 1988 Gold Cup from Cavie's Crown in second. Unbeaten Crebensis is much fancied to take the champion hurdle. Classical Charm on the near side, Celtic Shot on the far side, it's Classical Charm for Alden, Celtic Shot on the far side, Classical Charm and Celtic Shot as they race into the closing stages, Celtic Shot on the far side, Classical Charm on the near side, as they come to the line, Celtic Shot has won it, second is Classical Charm, third is Celtic Chief preview of next week's festival meeting after today's racing at Chepstow, which begins with a one o'clock. Ice hockey, two of the leading teams in action, Five Flyers and Murrayfield Racers. And the pace will slow a little for Bowles. The first semi-final of the World Indoor Championships. Bowles, of course, a game of subtlety. Good afternoon. After the week's internationals, a full football league program for you today. As far as the bookies are concerned, the championship is all over. Arsenal 7-2 to two on. But they've got a tough home fixture today against Nottingham Forest, who've won their last seven away games. Anyway, we'll keep you posted on all the football as usual. But let's begin, as promised, with some ice hockey action involving two of the leading teams in the country. Five Flyers lying third in the league. Murrayfield races just one place above them. Flyers against the racers, Red Emery and Barry Davis other commentators. We have here at Kakodi that special atmosphere which is always associated with a local derby. And with a touch of comedy too, perhaps. At stake being the top Scottish team in the Heineken League, avoiding the Durham Wasps in the first phase of the playoffs and keeping alive for both teams the faint chance of the title should the Durham Wasps somehow lose their way. 